So this is the 2016 probability concepts exam for NCA level 3 and we're cracking into question 2. Now this question you've got to read it really carefully. So what I'd like you to do is to pause the video, read it and underline what you think are all the, the key numbers and the key words. So a market research company employs five different observers to show how shoppers at a supermarket interact with products displayed on a particular shelf of an aisle of a supermarket. Each observer records the gender of the shopper, the shopper's estimated age band, and whether the shopper stops to look at the products on the shelf. In the most recent study of shoppers at the supermarket, the market research company found that 42.1% of the shoppers observed stopped to look at the products displayed on the shelf. The company also found that 70.4% of the shoppers observed were female. One of the observers has used this information to predict that 17.1% of shoppers will be male and will not stop to look at products displayed on the shelf. So let's just read that sentence carefully 17.1 percent of shoppers will be male and will not stop to look at products displayed on the shelf show how the observer made this prediction including stating any assumptions that were made and we always know when it says that that means there are assumptions okay so what we've got to think about here is how would they have got that figure of 17.1%? And it must be based on the information given. If you look, the only two, um, well, the only statistics that we've been given so far are the 42.1% um, stop to look and 70.4% 70 were female. And the claim of 17.1% is about males and not stopping to look. So if we simply base it on those two figures, how might they have arrived at that? Let's have a look. So if 42.1% of the shoppers stopped to look, what percent didn't stop to look? Well, it must be the rest, mustn't it? So 1 minus 0 0.421, and that equals 0.579. Okay, why don't you pause the video now and see if you can do it from here. Only hit play once you've had a crack. So the next thing we need to find is the proportion who were male. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, if we assume they're either male or female, um, then if 70.4% of the shoppers were female to 29.6% or 0.296. Okay, so how using these two figures, because these are the only two figures they could have used, because um, it says they used this information, how could they have arrived at the 17.1%? Again, pause the video and have a think about it. So they must have done what? They must have multiplied them. Because you know how normally, if we want to find the probability of two events happening, if we know they're independent, we, we multiply them. We multiply the probabilities of each event. So let's try that. And we get, sure enough, we get 17.1%. 0.171. So that explains where they got that figure, uh, where, the, where the observer got that figure from. Okay, so let's write that down, and then we'll talk about what assumptions the observer is making in doing that calculation. Okay, so we've shown how they worked it out. Um, now, so this assumes that the two events, not stopping and being male, are independent. In other words, it's saying that gender is independent of whether they stopped or not. Is that a reasonable assumption? Well be that there's a gender difference. It may be that either males or females are more likely to stop and look 
means that we should regard it with caution. So this assumes this assumes that whether a shopper in the study is male is independent of whether or not they stop to look at the products. And I would just say this is a very questionable assumption without evidence to support it. Okay, so let's just have a wee look at what the marking schedule said about this question. Okay, so it went as far as merit. And they've got the same thing basically as us. Their explanation is the observer has assumed independence of events, does not stop to look at the products, and is male to calculate the combined or joint probability of these two events, which is just a, a fancy way of saying the same thing that we did. Um, for merit, which was the maximum, you had to show how the joint probability, that means the probability of both happening, was calculated. Explain the assumption of independence. And what it doesn't say here um, is that th that really needed to be in context too. So if you just said the two events are independent, then don't expect to get the merit grade there. You've got to say what the two events are. So there's got to be context language. Does not stop to look and is male needs to be there. Okay, on to the next question. So part two. It is also known that 38.7% of the shoppers in this most recent study were female and, and stopped to look at the products displayed on the shelf. Use this information to predict how many shoppers out of every 300 shoppers at the supermarket will be male and will not stop to look at the products. So male and will not stop to look at the products. Okay, so what we want to do now, we've been given some new information. There's a, there's a space here. So that's a big clue that it's going to be sensible to do a diagram. When we do a diagram for probability, the first one we should always consider is what? A two-way table, because a two-way table is pretty much the easiest one, isn't it? And we only need to move beyond a two-way table if either, we, if either some of the probabilities we're given in the question are conditional ones, because it's hard to show conditional ones in a two-way table, then we'd use a tree diagram. Or if we have three categorical variables, like three things going on, and then we'd need to use a three-way Venn diagram. So, can we get away with a two-way table? Let's have a look. We're dealing with how many category variables? We're dealing with gender, and we're dealing with whether they stop or not. So therefore, we don't need a three-way Venn diagram. Um, now, the 38.7% is of all the shoppers, so that's not a conditional probability. And the other figures we've given earlier on are also of the shoppers as well. So therefore, none of these are conditional. Therefore, we don't need a tree diagram. So, yep, we can get away with a two-way table, which is good. So, let's draw that up. We are dealing with female and male. And stop or don't stop to look at the products. Okay. So let's just piece it all together. So if we go back to the first part of the question, we're told that 42.1% of the shoppers um, stop to lock. So where's that going to go? Well, that's going to go in the total for stopping to lock. So 0 0.421. Okay, what I'd like you to do now is to pause the video and see if you can fill in the rest of those cells in that table. Really important that you actually do the thinking here because if you just treat this like a movie and just watch it passively you're not going to get much out of it to really learn here you need to be having a go at these problems too okay so the next thing um, we're told that 70.4 percent of the shoppers were female so where's that going to go that's going to go in the bottom left total so 0 0.704 and what else now we've been told that 38.7% of the shoppers 
with female and stop to lock. So that means the female column and the stopping row. So that's going to go here. So 0 0.387. Okay, so it's out of 100% or one hole. So that's going to be the grand total. It's going to go here. And then we can just fill in the rest by subtracting. Okay, so there we are, and I double checked that I could get this figure here two different ways as well to make sure that I was right. That's always good practice. Okay, so um, what was the question again? When you've filled in the table, it's always supposed to reread the question, so we remember the detail. Um, use this information to predict how many shoppers out of every 300 shoppers in the supermarket will be male and will not stop. So male and not stop is male not stop is here. So that's going to be 0 0.262 or 26.2% and that's out of 300 shoppers. So let's write that down first. So probability male and don't stop is 0 0.262. And so how many would we predict out of 300 shoppers then? So we go 0 0.262. 26.2% of, so times 300, and that equals 78.6. 78.6 people, or shoppers. Okay, so if we were trying to put that into context, we would say what? So predict about 79 shoppers and it's only an estimate isn't it why is it only an estimate well it's only an estimate because what we're doing is we're using data from a sample so from a survey because it says here a recent study and we're trying to extend that to shoppers in general just any 300 shoppers and there's going to be other factors that may affect those um, those shoppers as well. It may depend on time of day. Well, it will depend on time of day. It will depend on time of week, time of year. It will depend on what the shop, where the shop is, and um, the demographics in that area, and so on. It's going to depend on lots of things. So it's just an estimate, and that's why we would say predict about 79 shoppers. Okay, marking scheme. So if we look at that, and they've got the same thing as us, and it's a merit. Um, if you have the prediction calculated and it said that except if you round it down to 78 shoppers too. Okay, part B. Have a read of it yourself. Just pause the video. Every tenth shopper observed in the recent study took a survey. One of the questions in the survey asked the shopper to select their actual age band. The market research company compared each shopper's estimated age band with the actual age band. So, and based on these comparisons, calculated each observer has an 86% accuracy rate for estimating the shopper's age band. So just pause the video and have a think about this. What's it actually saying? So it must be saying that each shopper was observed and the observer guessed their age band, their age group, and what we're looking at is if they got it right. So if they thought the, if the person was actually between uh, 25 and 29 and the observer guessed that correctly, then that would be success. If they guessed they were between, um, say, 20 and 24, then they got it wrong. And it's saying that 86% of the time the observers got it right. Okay, the question then says, give one reason why this accuracy rate is only an estimate for the true probability that an observer will record, to an observer will record each shopper's actual age band correctly. So what's this question assessing? Well, it's assessing our understanding of the difference between 
what we call true probability of something and an experimental estimate of that probability. The true probability of a particular observer guessing a particular person's age correctly is going to depend on a few things. What might be some things it might depend on? So have a think about when you try and guess someone's age. Do you ever find that it's easier to get some people's ages right than others? And do you find that you have some friends that tend to be better at guessing ages than others? It's true, isn't it? There's a lot of things that come into it. So just because in one particular study, this particular observer happened to get 86% right, and we're actually not told anything about the observer or observers. We're not told how many there were. We're not told how many people they actually um, observed. So we're just told that overall they got 86% right. So that's an experimental estimate, an estimate from an experiment. So a good way with a question like this, where it's hard to know what to write, is to start by stating the obvious. Okay, so let's start by stating the obvious. The 86% accuracy rate is only an experimental estimate of the true probability that a particular that any particular observer correctly guesses any particular shopper's age band. The true probability will also depend on other factors like the age band of the shopper, and we need to explain why. Some age groups may be easier to identify than others, or to distinguish than others, and that's important, isn't it? So we've explained why that's a factor, and also the observer, in particular the observer's ability to correctly identify someone's age. Okay, and it says give one reason. So we could have given more, we could have talked about the fact that, we've, you know, this is only a sample, and we're not sure, so it's only a sample of observers, we don't even know how many observers there were, um, and we don't know also um, how big the sample of shoppers was either, and the age distribution of those shoppers, because that may not represent the population of all shoppers. So there's a lot of stuff we're not being told. But we only had to give one reason, and so in the interest of time, that'll do. If we look at the marking scheme, um, and it says here possible reasons, the accuracy rate is based on a sample of observed customers, one in every ten, and no sample is ever going to be a perfect um, representation of the population. Each observer will have their own accuracy rate. 86% rate is across all observers. I kind of talked about that. The accuracy rate could also change over time as the observer gains more experience. Now that's a good point that I didn't think of. Um, the accuracy rate could be different depending on the characteristics of the shopper, and we, we, we kind of talked about that. And it says, accept other valid possible reasons. 